Thank you, Chris. All right, so I am happy to introduce our two guest speakers sure. today. We have Somic Raha and Peter Maxine, um, both, I believe, graduates of the DA program here. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> one graduate of the DA program here, I apologize. Uh, two experts in framing at SmartOrg. I believe I've hosted, you, many of you have, have actually provided feedback about uh, David Matheson's framing video that was recorded last year in this course. And um, both Peter and Somic worked with David over at SmartOrg, so we're happy to have them and hear their uh, discussion today about framing. So, Somic, thank you. So I graduated not too far back from this very program, and I want to start by saying take this class extremely seriously. It has launched many careers, and if you are interested in a DA career, you just keep in touch with the TAs. Uh, there are a lot of people who look for folks with the talents that are being developed in this class. So with that, so we're going to talk about framing. So my name is Somek, and this is Peter. Peter uh, has been doing decision analysis before from before I was born. So he has a lot of experience. And we're going to share our perspectives on different topics in framing. And we may not always agree. But if we disagree, you should you, that that's OK. You should realize that it's by design. Hopefully, we'll confuse you a little bit so you can think for yourself. So I'm going to start with a very basic question. What is framing? And when I was in your place, I was pretty confused about this particular question. So this is what we were told in the problem session slides, that a frame is a limited description of a problem that filters what is relevant. And so you're seeing your picture of the world through the camera. And so you have uh, the view of the whole mountain. You, know, you don't really know where to begin. Or you have this guy canoeing very happily down the river. What you don't see is there's this big waterfall, and if you don't make a decision, you're going to perish. That's the frame you really need at that point of time. So rooting in the present moment is very important for a frame. And we do, we've seen this also in problem session slides. So you have this issue of being overwhelmed by a frame. You have this problem of blindness. You don't really see what's in front of you. And you want to get the appropriate frame. We've also seen this slide, which is about the formulate, evaluate, and appraise model. And mostly framing, we touch framing in the structuring phase. So this is really the engineer's view of the world. And what we're trying to do here is figure out enough of the frame so we can start to model it. So those are the tools that you've been engaging with in your exercise. Now there's another tool which I believe the TAs would have covered. Is that correct? Have you shown this one? You haven't? OK. So it, it, it usually flashes by very quickly, this particular tool. It's called the dialogue decision process. It's what you get into when you have to work with more than one person in a company. If you have a whole group, how do you engage in the decision conversation with them? I, I came across it kind of late in the process while I was taking this class. And I had a very theoretical understanding of it. But as it happens, this, this so I've taken this picture from this guidebook, which was created by a consulting company called Strategic Decisions Group, and which then also split off to SmartArc and STG. But the person who made the guidebook is Peter McNamee, and he's going to tell us what this diagram means and how it connects to the previous one. Peter, go ahead. Um, uh, most of my work started out, I started out doing decision analysis back in the 70s. And most companies were too much command or military style uh, decision making. Guys have taught me decision, give me the view of the world. Experts, and it's very much like what you're, you're taught in, in classes about how decisions work, decision analysis work. Uh, what happened though with diffuse decision making, delegated decision making, is groups are responsible for decisions. And not only that, but decisions that decisions are complex enough that you have people at the top who make decisions who don't have enough time to, to consider everything that goes into it, so they trust a bunch of people to do the analysis. So the severe communication problems, and uh, this is meant to deal with that. Rather than say, go off, study this, come back and tell me what to do at, at the end of three months, this type of process says, 
we have a core team that does all the work. They look at something, they do framing, which is basically assessing the situation in this picture. Then they talk to the decision board, the decision makers, about framing. Do we have this problem right? Are we solving the problem we told us to solve? We found things that are in this problem that maybe you didn't think about. And so it's a series of discussions along the way so that by the time you reach the end, uh, there is an agreement along the way as to what the best is. So, so that's what this is, as opposed to the individual decision maker, which I think we're going to talk about in a second. Yes. And then do you want to talk about the connection between the two? Long time. Uh, this is the thing you're familiar with, which basically talks about a single decision maker who structures the problem. You, know, you look at the, the values, you think about the uncertainties, you weigh everything, you say, are we ready to make a decision, or do we have to go back and do it over again, enlarge it, refine it, and that. This is the individual decision making paradigm that is sort of embedded in decision analysis. How do these two work together? Typically, this happens in the back room, the analysts, the people who are working on the core, uh, that they will. Shortly after the framing is done, they'll begin to, to go through your structure tools. Uh, some place in here, when you develop some alternatives and evaluate, begin evaluation, that's when this really comes in. But, and then, so, so that's how the two fit together. This is how the analysis is done, basically, and this is how the group exercise, the, the group interaction is done. So this, this is a particularly helpful model to understand how you you do the process side of it when you're trying to help a client. And to summarize what Peter just said, this view of framing is that framing is basically fleshing out what you've seen in the decision hierarchy. And you've worked out the decision areas in the strategy table, which is basically the columns. And have you all finished the strategy table exercise or gotten a rough draft with you? You've all got it? Okay, I'll be looking at it in a moment in an exercise. So, so you've, you've, in this exercise, you basically got the decision areas down, you've got a couple of alternatives listed, but you haven't worked out the themes across it. So when you get into the themes land, then you're in, in the alternative space, which was here. So there's an interesting distinction there that framing is what you do before you develop your alternatives very seriously. Well, but it, as it so happens in the DA2 exercise that you have, it's, it's a lot of things, it's not just framing, it's also the development of themes. I believe you've been asked to, you know, look at the strategy themes that emerge with your, in your conversations. So I find this picture a lot more helpful. And this picture is basically says there's a commissioning phase, which is why are we doing this project? And how long is it gonna be? Who's gonna be involved? What's it gonna cost? There are all of these questions that come up. Then there's an opening conversation with the client. And that opening conversation involves an assessment of what is the ground reality? Why are we here? What are the big problems we are facing? And that's where you do a lot of the framing conversation. But there's also the envisioning dialogue, which is what can we do about this? What are our alternatives? What are the themes that are emerging? And once you've got this pot really opened up, that's when you try to then close it up with your evaluation of your analysis and get some insights. So the exercise that you have in this class is really about all three steps, commissioning, framing, and alternatives, in my mind at least. So that's one view of what you're really trying to do here. But what is a frame? And I found this really interesting video that I'll share with you. So in my Sphere of Flakes video, I joked about folding and cutting space time, but then I thought, hey, why not? So uh, how do you do that? Well, when we wanted to fold and cut only space, we chose a medium that takes place in space, that is static paper cutouts or sphere sculpture, but to fold and cut time, we need a medium that happens over time. I choose music. Music has two easily recognizable dimensions. One is time, and the other is pitch space. Not quite the same as space space, but it's one dimensional, which makes things easier. But let's not get confused with the notation. There's a few things to notice about written music. Firstly, that it's not music. You can't listen to this, or well, you can, but it'll be like. 
it's not music, it's music notation, and you can only interpret it into the beautiful music it represents. Kind of like how a book is squiggles on a page that your brain interprets into a meaningful story. And maybe you don't understand it at all, or understand just a literal surface meaning of the action, or maybe you can read deep and critically into a story that's simple on the surface, and get more from it than even the author intended. Math is like this, too. Secondly, written music... So, this is a fantastic uh, YouTube... Uh, I would call her a blogger. She makes these amazing videos about math. She makes math really cool. And she made a very important point that the equations are not math. What you're writing down is notation. They're not words. They become words in your brain. And by extension, I would say that all the tools that you're using to capture the frame are very helpful, but they're not the frame. Because the frame is in your brain. Okay? So it's this amorphous like water. What? Where does water begin and end? And actually the frame is in the shared brain. You've got a group of people you're trying to get at, what's, what's really happening? What are we trying to do here? And it's amorphous. It's difficult. It's the most uncomfortable part of decision analysis. It's also the longest phase. The rest of it, once you're in engineering land, we know how to do. It's a linear process. But this is not linear stuff at all. But Peter has a slightly different perspective. Right. And, and this is in, in terms of a good process. It's all well and good to have things in people's heads. And if you're the decision maker, it's what's in your head that matters. But when it's a good group, which is not really an individual, and, uh, it's what's on paper that's important. The group comes together, they think, they share whatever's in their head as best they can, and they write on paper, this is the problem as we see it, and agree that this is the problem. So if you say it's, on, uh, it's a, an expression of what's in people's heads, it's not even quite that. It's an agreed on, this is the problem we're solving, given these constraints. So that, that's what I meant, it's on paper. Yeah, just another one, so you're moving your perspective from let's do the best job we can to let's do the best job we can given the resources and time constraints we have. That's a central issue when you're working with organizations. Yeah, that, that's the essential issue of how the, that, um, this, the dialogue decision process works. So you're moving from a philosophical idea to practical, you know, deadlines, constraints, and all of that stuff. How do you help people move the ball forward in their conversation? Next, I'm going to introduce a book that rocked two major worlds. This book is called The Pattern Language. It was written by this guy named Christopher Alexander. He was an architect, and he's an iconoclast. He is not very well liked in his peer community because what he did redefined their field. He said that architecture is not something you do you know, as, as an elite professional. This is something which anybody can do. Any individual wanting to make a beautiful home should have the building blocks to be able to do so. And what he did was he defined what he called a pattern language, which basically described common solutions to common problems. And he created a whole dictionary to talk about it and to interlink concepts that regular people could access. So if you, if you were facing a particular problem, you could pick a pattern that applied in your situation and then just go, go build it or go do it. And you could suddenly use different patterns to make a complete building, a complete neighborhood, a full city. So it's a very fascinating work that redefined the field of architecture. But it wasn't limited to that field it went over to the field of computer science. And the computer science guy said, you know, we don't make brick and mortar buildings, but we make software. And software has some of the same problems. We're all trying to make beautiful design. And there's a lot of community wisdom here. What if we try to capture that wisdom through patterns? And so a great book was written called Design Patterns, which revolutionized the concept of design in software in the software industry. And what, ha what happened after that was it spawned many efforts to mine patterns in different professional fields. And a key idea there, so I'm going to tap into that wisdom and I'm going to share the rest of you know, today with, through patterns, uh, our hard-won wisdom in framing. And the idea behind a pattern is this. Each pattern describes the problem which occurs over and over again in our environment and then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use the solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. This is a quote from the Design Patterns book. And a pattern comes with certain elements of language. First is the name, 
with which you will refer to it. Second, what is the problem statement? What is the solution to it? Sometimes there's an evocative image and consequences and there'll often be implementation notes. So that's, there's a whole form to each pattern. And I've, we've collected a couple of patterns and we probably won't have time to go through all of them. So I'm gonna do a quick poll to see where people are at. So I'll, I'll give you a basic description of how this catalog is organized. So the commissioning patterns are around how do you get a project started and what is important? How do you communicate what's at stake? How do you pick the right process for your needs? And how do you share the arc of strategy with your client? So this is stuff which often, I, I'm pretty sure, doesn't get covered in school. So that might be very useful to you. And we, then we have patterns for assessing your situation. And there are two tools which are very useful here. One is issue raising and the other is a decision hierarchy. And these patterns have to do with some specific wisdom around issue raising and using the hierarchy. And patterns for envisioning the future, focusing exclusively on the strategy table. It's a, in, an incredibly powerful tool to move the conversation forward on what are your alternatives and these tap into that. So we, want have, we have some exercises around these two and this is more of a quick introduction so if we, do, if we do this, then we'll get less time for exercises. And if we focus more on this, we may or may not have time for this. So do you guys have a preference? What you'd like to see? Yeah. I have a preference on exercises. Exercises? Yeah. All right. Then let's try this. We can, I'll skip commissioning and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into stuff that you may have already done. So you may be able to participate. Yeah, Brian. Patterns for envisioning the future, is this, to, is this, are these things for trying to get your client to have kind of prospect driven thinking? Uh, it's more than prospect. It's, you know, when you say prospect, I'm thinking of the tree, the end of the tree, but it's, it's oh. yeah, it's possible futures. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I have a question about this. So, um, this idea of like kind of using patterns, yeah. it seems like you know that can save you time so that you don't end up like reinventing the wheel. So if you have these kind of basic tools, when something comes up, you know you can solve it again pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, then that also may constrain um, oh, yeah. your imagination. Like there's this trade off between like adaptation and exploitation, yes. and I think using patterns is yes. exploiting things in your past knowledge. Yes. But you know if you look at architecture, um, if you need to just build a building. Yeah. Building it with the patterns of brick and mortar are really great, but then you never get advancements in architecture. Yes. Um, so I may be misunderstanding this a little bit, but yeah, it so seems like there's a real danger there to to really focus just on patterns. And well, so the, the intent behind patterns is there's a lot of warm and fuzzy stuff. There's a lot of wisdom in which people implement or deal with certain problems, and that comes after years of experience. Patterns is a way of telling the stories around that or capturing that so you don't have to go through 10 years, you can already leverage that wisdom. Now, having said that, of course, you can overuse, you can take it like a cookie cutter solution and completely misapply it. That danger will always be there for not just patterns, for any kind of knowledge you're given. For instance, you could take DA and you could apply it in a place where it doesn't make sense. And then, you know, you made a bigger mess than than it was before. So that, that, that trap will... The, there's no alternative to keeping your mind open and aware of these dangers where you're overusing because you're just enthusiastic about it. So you're saying that patterns are valuable because they kind of bring you up to speed with the, the state yeah, of they, the knowledge in the field. They at least give you a language in which to talk about problems where this language didn't exist earlier. So let me do this. I'm gonna uh, give you a very brief, you know, breeze through the first part and not spend too much time on it just so you know what's in there, we can get back to it if there is interest at the end, and then I'll go straight to the, the other two patterns, the sections, okay? So what's at stake? Um, there's a lovely video, I would have, I'll play for it, you know, if there's time at the end, I'll play it for you. But the, but the key idea in this is people listen differently, and when you're talking to an audience, you have to be mindful of the fact that people, some people are motivated by their head, by rational arguments, some people are motivated by their heart, and some people are motivated by the wallet. And you'll have a mix of all three. So the most convincing or the, the most impactful uh, lines of arguments touch on all three 
elements. So it's head, heart, and wallet. And you've have, and they're all important. It's not that you're trying to manipulate someone. It's that you want to be rational about something, but rationality always serves a deeper purpose. It comes from the heart when you're delivering on some values. Why are you doing something? Because it has a deeper meaning behind it. So what is that meaning? That is what inspires people. And wallet is important because if you don't have resources in which is, it's just talk, you can't really make anything happen. So you have to be very respectful of the resources at your disposal. So all three have their place. And in your commissioning statement, you've got to make it clear what's at stake at all three levels. And that then you really start to make inroads into people's minds and get buy-in and support for examining or conducting an inquiry. But this idea is also very useful as you go deeper into any kind, you know, as you're going further into the project and you're giving your insights, trying to find what it means from the head perspective, from the heart perspective, and the wallet perspective. It's a very useful way, simple way of thinking about things. And uh, this comes with the work of Chris McGovern. He, had, he adds two more elements. You want to think about what are the elements that are pushing on these three dimensions and how is this pulling you forward? So you kind of adds the push and the pull aspect to it as well. So that's a very quick summary of a little framework and I'll put the link in so you can watch it separately if you don't get to play it here. But that's that idea, what's at stake. And once you establish what's at stake, then that really sets you up for framing. As in, why are we doing this? Because this is what's at stake. And if you can do this exercise for your clients, that'd be fantastic, making it clear why should we be discussing this right now. Uh, the right, yeah, go ahead. What if you had different conflicting sticks, then what do you do? Well, you need to put it on the table. What is at stake? Um, you, usually what's at stake is not conflicting. It's the, it's the preferences that may be conflicting, or maybe there are some needs that some people have diff, you know, one particular need, another person has the exact opposite need. But what's at stake is if you don't resolve that, there'll be a lot of conflict, there'll be a lot of chaos, certain things that were continuing a certain way will not continue any further and the whole industry will melt down. That's what's at stake. So the, the conflict is the, is the issue at hand, but what's at stake is the impact if that conflict continues. So you want to get to that deeper, you know, why should we care to resolve this? And not all conflicts need to be resolved, right? Does that answer your question? The right size pattern is about, you know, People have different kinds of decision problems and not everything requires a big bang decision analysis. So you want to pick, you want to identify the scope of the problem and pick a process that's appropriate for that scope. And here's a little graph that is very helpful. So you, on one scale, you have the difficulty level of the problem. On the other scale, you have the uh, difficulty level of the people issues with it. So if, if it's just one person, you're thinking through a decision, then the people difficulty is quite low. And you can do well with a simple approach. You, know, you can use the six elements of decision quality. And if, as you go down the scale, and things get very ambiguous and certain dynamic, you know, complex, and it's very important, then you need a systems approach to it. Get more structured around it. And as you go up this dimension, then you have barriers to communication, you have political situations, you have a lot of confusion simply because in a large organization, not everybody talks to everybody. Then you have biases, you have hostility. People say, I don't want to support your program and now you've got to exist in this environment. And you know, there are career limiting choices that you make as well. So there are all these issues that impinge on your thinking and you want to tackle those as well. And there you, know, you tackle barriers by getting into, trying to figure out how you can communicate more clearly, want to you know, get over confusion through a learning enabled organization be more open about your biases and try to try to circumvent them. So there are all these things you can do. And as you go towards this side of this uh, little framework, you there's a need to be very explicit, very deliberative, very thorough. But it comes up when the people complexity and the problem difficulty is quite high. So the, the dialogue process that Peter showed, it's up here in this space. You don't do the dialogue process if it's just one individual and you know, you're just talking through a you know, decision. So here's a little map that might help you pick the right process for your clients or at least propose it. So the dialogue process, you know, multi-step, um, this you know, is needed when it's really complex. If it's a major project with a couple of stages, you don't need um, a separate executive team or a board involvement. It's just, you know, 
there's decision makers, there's a, there's a group of people who will work on the strategy and they'll interact with each other. If, it, if, it's a, if it's not a major project, then maybe it's a workshop with a group over a couple of days and you've got the insights and you move on. And it might be even smaller than that. You use a few tools to advance the conversation. Maybe they're stuck with values or maybe they're stuck with alternatives. Use a tool, you've delivered some value there. Or if it's just an individual decision, use this do-it-yourself decision quality worksheet. And you know, this drives the converse conversation, makes it deeper, helps people reflect on what's important. So that's a little map that might help you pick the right process for the job. So with that, and I'm gonna skip this. The strategy arc is basically the stuff that I talked about earlier. This is for a major complex project, showing people what, what the full arc is, is really important in getting buy-in. And you know, you, because there are different behaviors that are expected at different levels. So in the opening behavior, you don't want people to get all rational and all critical about it. You want them to hold the space, hold the creative tension. Closing phase, you definitely want to be hard-nosed about it. That's a different kind of behavior. So getting a sense of what's expected is very important in communicating that clearly. So with that, I'm gonna move on to patterns for assessing our situation. So you get to issue racing, and the first one here is the icebreaker. So you can use the issue raising tool as a powerful icebreaker in groups. So, because it's very awkward in this first conversation you're doing in strategy, you haven't really created a rapport with people. So that's the problem that deals with, that you don't have those relationships in place. Start off with you know, getting everybody to go around the group and state what are the issues that they're really concerned about. And you note it all down, project it on a screen and get by and okay, are we, you know, it's, are we, are we, collecting the right issues here. And it also gives, a, gives people a chance to uh, hear from each other, hear what other people think are the issues and not just what's in their head. So it's a very nice way to, to start that wrap-up process and get a sense of the lay of the land of what people are concerned about. And it also gives you something to come back to at the end saying, with this strategy project, we believe we've tackled some of the substantial issues here. So Peter, do you want to add to that? No, I just well, one of the really important things here, though, is I think something some of you mentioned is the round robin. Because when you're collecting issues, it's very easy to have somebody, especially the boss, dominate the conversation. And there are different people, the extroverts and the introverts, react differently. So having people write things down, taking one issue at a time, going around and around the table, really is very important in this. I mean, it sounds like a trivial process um, idea, but it really is what makes this valuable. Yeah. You usually go from junior to senior to make sure that all the issues are heard in the right way. We place. go in the order in which they're sitting. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. no seniority. So, so sometimes it's important to pick who to start with, but yeah. that's... Uh, and another thing I want to mention about this, the way this is organized, this deck, is that I've, the implementation notes would make the slide too wordy, so I've put it in the notes section of the slide. There'll be some practical advice on how to actually do Second one, the wine bottle. So this one becomes very interesting when you're, when you're facing a very complex decision problem. So what happens is you start doing issue raising and people surface a bunch of concerns, which are basically like whining. You know, oh, this doesn't happen in our company. Oh, we don't have the resources we need. So you have to be very careful about that kind of stuff because that's, you know, they're basically distracting themselves by what can be solved with strong management resolve. So you'd want to ask the team, you know, if, can, if, if the management were to get their head around this and really push it forward, would this still be an issue for you? And if they still say, so if they say this can be tackled by management resolve, you park it in a separate poster, say, okay, we've got it down, we will talk to management about you know, fixing this, but this is not a strategic issue. Now let's move on to what's really a challenge that cannot be solved, even if management says, yes, we'll do this. So that's what you want to get down to. And if you do this right, you'll basically get a sense of the real strategic challenges that your frame needs to address. <laughs> yeah, that's coming up next. So here's the example. So this is from a real strategy exercise. We started off with this and we said, well, uh, what are the issues? One, one team said, well, we are asked for category understanding, but we lack this because our lack of category understanding impedes the request for relevant information. So when people ask us, for market information, we can't give it to them because we don't have category understanding. So this is the issue that they've surfaced. So how would you critique this? Okay. 
Let's say you just heard this issue, what are you gonna do with this? You gonna accept it or are you gonna dig deeper? That's why they don't have that understanding. Yeah, why don't you have this understanding? Why don't you just go get it, okay? So what prevents your category understanding? Well, they say next, well, converting raw fragmented data into knowledge and cross-referencing with customer. This is the big issue for us. What are you gonna do with this? Do you think this is a real strategic issue? Sounds like a training issue. Sounds like a training issue? Other comments? Um, can you just clarify what cross-referencing with customer means? Well, as in, you, so they, they're looking at this from this statement, they're looking at this as a massive data collection exercise. And so you get the data, it's all fragmented, you, f you convert it into knowledge, it's a magic wand, and then you go back to the customer and say, yeah, is this right? And the customer says, yeah, this is, you've got it right. That's what they're thinking the process is. You say, well, if this is what you think is the issue, why don't you just go do this? So we kept pushing and then the answer was, well, you can't really do this because the industry we are dealing with is highly fragmented. It's a young industry. You, know, you can't get deep category understanding in this environment. Now that is a real strategic issue that even if you just went and did it, you still couldn't get the category understanding you want because of the nature of that market. So that's the kind of stuff you want to surface and not just accept what comes at face value. So, and one, one big clue about all of this is if the stuff looks really boring, it's probably not an issue. It's like just words. And you, you dig deeper, dig deeper. This has emotion behind it. It's like, this is a frustration. We can't deal with this problem, okay? So our frame needs to really tap into this energy. And so another interesting thing I noticed about this is this is an internal problem. As you keep digging deeper, you finally uncover something which is beyond your control. That's a real issue. You, you really don't know how to deal with this. Any reflections? Yeah. So this is where I get a little bit um, concerned, if you want, about your role as a decision analyst versus your role as a consultant. And where do these, like, you know, where's the gray area in between? Is it, is it always true that if you are a decision analyst, then you also have to be a consultant and you need to go around and, like, you know, tell people what they need to do or how do you think things can be better? Or is it just you need to stick to your job as a decision analyst and try to get the information and pre present them the information that you get so that you're not creating any biases on the decisions that they are actually making? I have some thoughts that come up, but I'm going to... I want to hear Peter's thoughts on this. <laughs> and that's the obvious, really difficult question. Um, all I can tell you is my experience is uh, most people do require some help getting through internal things, and this is basically an internal understanding. Uh, this clarification came not from the consultant, it came from the person in the room, the, the persons in the room. And I've seen that over and over again. That uh, you know, people begin to contribute, and when you try this uh, conversation, people will follow it and get down to the, the nubbins of it. So, so this is not bringing this is bringing skill and coaching rather than skill as a. Now, what what you call a consultant? I'm not sure. Um, a consultant is a person bringing knowledge. That's not what's go, what's going on here. It's bringing knowledge about process, about patterns, about tricks of the trade. Uh, and sometimes you do bring in, you've been around here a long time, you know that there's probably something hidden here. So it, it helps you uh, drive it. But um, I, I guess in the, the bottom line is being a pure decision analyst which just takes knowledge from people and distills it and gives them back results doesn't seem to work uh, in the real world. <laughs> in, in the sense that people do require some help in getting down to the nubbins of what they truly believe or or what they truly know. And so there's there's a certain amount of coaching going on. So I guess just like as, as a quick follow up, that, that from a philosophical perspective, not necessarily on this on this question, but or in this example, but from a general broad perspective, if you are also acting as a consultant, can you still be very truthful to your decision analyst role? Because if you are a consultant and you're providing recommendations you are putting part of your view of the problem in, in that decision-making process. I, 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 I agree that giving recommendations is not part of the role that you should have. Um, and so that type of consultant I have never done. 
uh, and uh, you know, some people do, and, and some people there's a mixture of the two. But it's, it's basically trying to pull what is truly in the group or in people out and surface it in a useful and manipulatable fashion. What, one word I, that comes to my mind that seems to reflect from Peter's discussion is the word facilitator. Is that something, so you're not, um, it's not about bringing your own idea in, it's about how can you help people express what they sort of want to express. Yes. The, 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 the key thing, if you, if, you, if, if you are trying to do, be a consultant in this space is you are a coach, you never give the answers, you ask some really hard questions. And you don't let people off the hook until they've really gone somewhere which will help them. And I think that's, and I'll just have one more thing over what Peter said. There's something interesting with that question itself. As engineers, it's very safe for us to get into our Excel land because we understand that really, really well. It follows the rules of logic. This stuff doesn't. It follows a different kind of logic. And we don't really understand it. We've been taught to respect the other kind of logic, so we don't know how to live in this world. And this is, a, this is a huge problem because a lot of problems that can be solved very easily with people interactions, we bring it into modeling land and make unnecessarily complex systems that don't serve anyone. So in the interest of who you're trying to so uh, serve as a decision analyst, it's our responsibility to develop these people's skills because we are ultimately helping human beings. And if you are going to keep the human out of the picture, there was a talk I recently heard if only the people could be removed from decision analysis, right? <laughs> that, that's not a very helpful frame, I would say. Uh, the computers would be great decisions. Yeah, right. Just, just one, one quick comment from my experience. I've done a million of consulting jobs. Um, and quite frankly, usually I don't have any idea of what the content is. You know, I did a lot of work at GM. I'm not a car guy. I don't know. You know I learned some of the words along the way. But that wasn't my role. My role was really to facilitate in the sense of to run meetings, to elicit knowledge, to structure the model, uh, to do everything that you would think of a decision analyst doing, but also being able to help people get to the point where they can use it and contribute and receive. So there's a big difference between facilitation and consulting in the sense of bringing prepackaged knowledge. It's a great question. Yes, Brad. If you do have. Um, knowledge by being consultant in the background. You bring, right? So for example, you're working for GM, but maybe you've done a lot of uh, work in the auto industry, or maybe you've done work in the uh, airline industry, and you've learned things, and you can say, like, this problem looks a lot like the problem we did for yeah. airline B. So, and this is what we learned from uh, this is, right? This is that edge, right? You're walking that edge on how much to interject. And I think it's a, so it's not a clear-cut thing. I mean, it's a, there's a temptation to yeah, there's, there's yeah. always a little bit of leading going on. You know where the model is going to come out. The model is going to come out. Revenue, cost, and, and revenue is going to be market share probably in this industry. You, you know where you're going. And so you tend to lead people there. But beyond that... Um, Generally, the successful engagements are the ones where people believe that they solve their problem themselves. And if they feel like you gave it to them, it doesn't work. At least not in my experience. I tried it. I, I saw the whole problem for a whole organization, and nobody took it. I mean, but they all said it, it solves the problem, but they just could not attach with it. So, I mean, you should definitely try. I mean, you try solving a problem with someone, and then try letting them solve it, and you just ask questions and see what happens. So, just in summary, if, if you look at a frame, there, there are familiar frames and there are unfamiliar frames. So, familiar is in the sense that you kind of know you're making a new car. Okay, well, how do we pick this design, design parameter and so on. You kind of understand what the decision is. In, in that situation, issue raising is a good idea to use as an icebreaker. But if you're in an unfamiliar territory where people are like, we want to grow in the next 15 years and we have no idea how, it's like a, you know open field, here are some challenges we vaguely are familiar with, but we, beyond that we don't know. Well, then issue raising is a very powerful discovery tool. And that's where the challenging and digging deeper becomes very useful. So there's a little map, if you will. Let's get to the decision hierarchy. So I find this one particularly useful to uncover hidden assumptions. Because oftentimes people will just state a decision frame as though, you know, they're just, you know, they're the constraints they're assuming as though they're just real constraints. 
But oftentimes, those constraints are made up in people's minds and they assume the boss wants this without actually checking with the boss. Or maybe the boss thinks he wants this, but when you challenge it, boss says, you know, that actually sounds stupid. So this, this pattern is around, find the assumption that is so obvious that people have forgotten to state it, but it's implied by their frame, and challenge it by putting it on the given, frame it as a decision. Oftentimes, when you do that, the decision sounds so stupid that people say, well, we never made that decision. You say, well, you're speaking as though you did. So we need to get it off this and let's see what it does to our frame. And the consequence of using this pattern is your frame will change because the imaginary constraints on your frame disappeared. Let's try a little example. Which, so this is the company that makes the Jaguar car, okay? And they're faced with this question, which car markets should we target our marketing efforts to sell the Jaguar? What do you think the givens are in, the, in this frame? What comes up for you? Yeah. Car markets, yeah. Just within that same environment, given that you're selling to car markets as opposed to as opposed to the other markets. Like, yeah. okay. um, it's like very good. Very good. Very good. What else? You're not going to change the car. Yeah, it's not going to change the car. Very nice. So, the key question here is: Who are the competitors of the Jaguar? What would you say to this question? Other cars and luxury goods. All cars and well, luxury. Other cars? Other in cars. That same of the same luxury category in cars. And other luxury goods. Like? Well. Yachts. Yachts. Very nice. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's, it's a, what he just did was he, he really expanded the frame there. A lot of times when we, when we ask this question, people will say things like the other luxury brands. But really if you think about it you're competing for discretionary income and so there are all these other things you can do with your discretionary income that competes with the spend on the jaguar and so if you reframe this you say well we're in the car business and we will invest in activities that result in the largest market share in our niche right that's that's sort of implied by saying which car market should we target that's like a commitment you've made you're only going to stay in a car market and you want to get the market share, the best market share you, can, you possibly can. And you see this, we'll say, wait a second, it's not so much market share in a small market. What if you increase the market? So you can change the question to which discretionary income segments should we target? And it's no longer about market share. It's about activities that will help with your market growing in size, where you're not competing necessarily with other folks, but together you're increasing the pie for everyone. And that's a very different frame, right? Now you could challenge the first given as well, we're in the car business. Well, if you did that, you'd say, well, what luxury products can we focus on in the coming year? Maybe we can take the engine of the Jaguar and put it somewhere else and come up with a new product. Now that's a more radical reframing. I don't know if, you know, so a lot of this depends on how far people are willing to go. <laughs> but it's, it's sort of an illustration that by making it explicit, you're, you're making people reflect, is this really true? Have we really made such a commitment? And if not, scratch it out and put in something that makes more sense. Peter, do you want to add? Just uh, one of the really common givens that people have is, this is the budget we have. One of the first projects did at the GM, they said, well, we got X million dollars to do this major renovation of the car line. Where that came from, nobody knew. <laughs> I, but they, they were structuring, they, they could only do part of what they needed to do with that amount of money. So was that a given or not? As part of the discussion you should have with the decision maker. Yeah. So a quick uh, suggestion on how you populate the givens is you have a higher level strategy theme that you need to be aware of in which you're operating. And so you, that creates the context for your downstream decision that you're helping with. So being aware of that, you know, that filters down into your information, your frame and your values. So that's just something that's moving on to the next section, which is on envisioning the future. So this is where the strategy table becomes a very useful tool. And first one is called the pink suit principle. So how many of you have tried a pink suit? How many of you want to try a pink suit? Well, only one hand went up. Well, that kind of illustrates the point. Okay, two more, good. So 
the issue is that when you have strategy themes on a table, you find oftentimes people get so anchored to the momentum, to the present reality, that they are unable to push themselves to extreme edges or to try something radically different. And so what you end up with is you're analyzing a bunch, bunch of alternatives, they're just like 10% better or worse than what you currently have. That's no good to anyone. So in order to really push yourself you know, into the extremes, you want to hold off the temptation to come to middle ground. You, even if you have got a great idea, you say, okay, let's bring it in and combine this from, the, from that idea and this from the other idea. Don't do any of that. Try to stay in the extreme land. Try to think of ideas that are way out there that you probably wouldn't be able to justify on their, on their own, but you want to hold that tension and keep it there so you understand what makes that idea tick. You really want to find what the key value drivers are and you will eventually end up hybridizing, taking the best of all the ideas you have but for the purpose of the strategy table, keep things as distinct as possible. That's the principle behind this. And that really enables you to learn you know, what's going on. So I have a little example for you here. Um, anything else? Okay. So here, you're looking at a simple car buying decision. You own a station wagon and brand is Ford and price $15,000, color is white. Now, a typical thing you might do is well, let me go one level up. Let me get a small SUV by GM. It's about the same price range, a little more expensive. It's gray in color. Okay, that could be one choice. That's a fancier version of what I have right now. A, a second option might be, I want to go a little cheaper. So I'll get a hatchback for $12,000. It's brown. It's about the same kind of color spectrum. And, okay, this is very linear, plus minus 15% thinking. This is mediocre thinking. This is not going to help. <laughs> so let's knock out those two options and let's push ourselves to go way out there. So, well, what would this mean? Well, what if I get a minivan? Like a completely different category, right? It's Toyota minivan, 25K, it's a neutral color. It's a family. So I'm thinking a family car, we can get two kids and you know two sets of parents in. It's a different use case. All right, that's an interesting future. It's quite, it's one extreme. The other end is, it's a commuter perspective. It's really compact. Prius. With great difficulty, you five people can fit in. 20k blue color. Okay. The colors are also very different. Now, this has really pushed you on two extreme ends. And when you see this picture, something comes up or something should come up in your mind. As in this one question we haven't asked yet, which emerges from this view. What is that question? Yeah. They're all cars. Of course, they're all cars. <laughs> well, why but there's something else going on here. Why do I need a new car? Why do I need a new car, exactly? And what does it mean for my fleet? So I already have an existing car. So there's another decision which we didn't discover earlier, which is, what do I do with my existing car? And in these two cases, I'll sell my current one and get this new one. But if I get the Prius, I'll keep my current station wagon because I'll get portfolio effects. When I want to go with the family, I use the station wagon. When I want to do my business, short trips, I use the Prius. That way I get fuel economy and I also have an option for taking the whole family along. So suddenly you're thinking in terms of a fleet and not in terms of an individual car. It changed your frame. So you see how pushing it to the extreme helps you discover a whole new decision area. And that's another move you want to try making on your strategy tables and see if you can really get a theme that's way out there. So I have a Quick exercise. How many of you have done some strategy themes in your problem? We'll have to end here, but this is just a model. Like you can easily meet after class and you should continue this dialogue because it's amazing what happens when you talk to someone else. You get a completely different perspective. So this is very good. All right, so the idea is that if you at least try the pink suit, maybe you'll be enticed by the pink tie and you might find it goes well with something else. So, but you would never have thought of the pink tie if you didn't try on the pink suit. That's the idea behind this. Um, the other thing that I found very useful and may help some of your groups is values-driven ideation. And that is people often get stuck, you know, they, they really can't envision the future. And so that's because our minds are very logical. We try to be linear. That's what engineering school teaches us. And ideation is about non-linearity. And so to get into that non-linear space, think about identity. Think about what drives people in this organization. Why are they coming to work every day? 
And if you have clarity on what those values are for that organization, then it gives you a structure in which to brainstorm. And what we found is people come up with lots of interesting ideas when they're clear about their values. But absent values, they're all over the place. They really don't know where to begin and how. They, nothing really feels right, so to speak. So that's, um, I have a little link of an article here which talks about a real life story, which I'll share very quickly. So this is a company uh, 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 into plastic. Let's just say that they're into plastic packaging. And we did a little exercise for them on what their values were. And one of their values was, uh, you know, people are able to trust food because of our packaging. They can consume it safely. Safety is a, is a, is a value for us because of our technology. And that's the dent we make in the universe. And so now when they're ideating, they're thinking about all the ways in which they can make food safer for the world. Notice they're not trying to save money or make money. That has to happen. Okay, that's how you do business. What they're ideating about is, how do you make the world a better place? That's how ideas come. That's how people get motivated to do something. And so it's a big trap to have the conversation go around, how do we increase market share? How do we save money? Those are fine goals, but they do not lead to high quality ideation. <coughs> so you want to tap into the noble space. The noble purpose is what we call it. That's the next pattern, which is, when people really lack clarity on where they stand on, so you want something, if that, many organizations know this, but if they don't, it might be helpful in the framing process to step back a little bit and find out well, what defines you, you know, as, a, as an organization. And I found it helpful to think of the head, heart, and the soul. And, you know, in, in, for instance, in the police department, some of you are working with them, it seems to me like their head is in, in policing, you know, that's their profession. That's what they've learned to do, right? But their heart is is really in this idea of, um, shall we say, you know, education. They they have they have remained in in Stanford for so long that they've kind of acquired that education perspective, that they don't just want to do enforcement. They want to educate people about how to be safe, and that's a very different kind of police department. And I would say that their soul is in fact in dignity where in their value statement, they have this, literally they, they say this, that we will treat everyone as our client and we will treat our clients with dignity. Client includes people you arrest, the drunk person you're getting off the street, that's a client. There are very few police departments in the world which are willing to say this and live by it. And so if you look at these three values, right? Policing, education, and dignity, that kind of tells you about the value DNA of this organization. Now with these three in mind, what alternatives can you come up with? What things could you do that deliver on these values, that can keep people safe, that can educate them themselves about how to be safe, and that you know that don't involve us violating people's dignity, that in, you know, we can keep people free as much as possible. So it, it, that's just one thought. Like, you know, it may or may not help, but you could do this for a for-profit business or a non-profit, anyone. It's a very simple way of thinking about values. Um, there's other techniques, right brain tap. So th this is this is about getting people uh, tapping into this weird space. A lot of brain research has shown this, that we really don't understand our brains very well. <laughs> but there's this whole right lobe that's untapped. And we've tried this and I've seen this work personally so many times, it's unbelievable. You show people a bunch of weird pictures, like just cut them out from magazines or get creative backpacks and ask them, tell me a life story that is explained by this picture, that connects to you, as in this is your life story, explain it to me. Or explain why your organization is here through this picture. And then, you know, stop and then tell them, go generate some more strategies. And suddenly they're coming up with all these amazing ideas. Like, what is going on? But it works. So, so it's just something to, you know, know in your, in your bag of tricks. This is an important one. So that's a quick summary of this. Peter, do you want to add something? I think Sue, Sad and Clever and all the rest of that. GM, when they started doing decision analysis on a routine basis, lots of stories about that. But they, they were able to establish how much they got, how much money they actually generated by actually looking rationally at what they were doing and being a good alternative. And it, it made a tremendous difference. But then they also went and looked at how much they actually got by hybridizing. Hybridizing only comes if you've done the pink suit. They phrase it as test wells. The same same type of thing. 
And they found that it actually doubled the value, right, as they could measure between that, what they would have chosen and what they wound up, cho wound up choosing, having considered all those various pink suit type things and kind of getting the best out. So it's not something trivial, it's not a trick. It is something which is really, uh, has resulted in some measurable value. Whatever if you think of the measurement techniques. <laughs> uh, I just don't want to lose that, and that, that is probably the, the most productive item on the list. Yeah, I would agree. <coughs> yes? What's a good strategy that you've encountered that encourages your clients that you're working with to think of these extreme ideas? Would it be the magazine clippings, or how do you get people to think instead of like the minivan, the Ferrari, or the helicopter, or like really outlandish pink suit ideas? I think it's all, it's not any one thing, but it's a, it's a, it's a state of being, like as you're getting into the, these engagements, at every touch point, you're really trying to push people to be much better than they thought they could be. So when you're doing the strategy table exercise, you try the pink suit. And you know, we, we were actually in a strategy table exercise like this one, and we, we got stuck. We didn't, we didn't do this value stuff because you know, we thought it would be cool. We got stuck, we couldn't move ahead. And that's when the plastic packaging company, we, we said, okay, we've tried everything possible. Our PhDs are not helping us. Let's try a values exercise. That's when we discovered their values around safety. Then another one was on natural packaging. Uh, that they, don't, they want people to get food without additives. They want economic food so people can afford things and packaging makes it possible. And there are other, other aspects around this. So this stuff came out of desperation, really. And then we found that all our left brain techniques did not work. That's when we came up with the right brain. So that really moved the ball forward. So now we've started being much more intentional about it. So that, you know, the copy pictures exercise is now a more explicit part of our strategy table uh, dialogue. The one thing as an outsider, because I was not involved in this, but I've seen these things, I find them alien to myself. Uh, this was actually a strategy project where the company was trying to figure out what it wanted to do with the rest of its life. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that was way back in commissioning. You know, what's this all about? Yeah. Uh, whereas there are other much more routine things where you don't have to think about what am I doing with the rest of my life. But you know, I have to think about really different ways of doing things that you hadn't thought about. Yeah. So the values, you, you, if somebody's trying to figure out what capacitor to put into a circuit, values probably not be relevant there. But the other stuff, the, the pictures and the right brain thinking, that I think would help. Other questions? Yeah. yeah what's the attempt for a framing exercise? Is it a question that both agree that is truly the essential question? Is it on the understanding of what are the assumptions? Is it a flavor of what a solution can look like? Is it all of these things at the same time? or? I think it's all of these things, I would say. Like the, the strategy table kind of tells you what are the things that are feasible, that are creative, that are worth exploring. And a frame kind of sets you up so you know that if you were to take the time to gather information, do scouting missions, where should you scope your efforts and how much should you do? A good frame will clearly tell you that next few steps, these are the ones that we really want to examine. These are all so good that we, you know, we can't really make up our minds. And then you, you do your numbers and all of that and then you hybridize. So the frame sets you up for all of that activity. So at the end of the frame, if you still don't know where to begin looking for information or what value conversations you want to have, then that's probably not a very useful frame. Uh, another way of thinking about this is, uh, I find I find that picture of decision quality very helpful. Let me just see if I can quickly get to it. Uh, we've we've kind of uh, changed that model a little bit. You've seen uh, we've changed a few words in this. So the frame, so we're looking at it from both a cool head perspective and a warm heart perspective. By the way, the cool head, warm heart. This comes out of Ron's paper in 1980, where he talks about the ideal of the Buddha, uh, who you know is not sentiment, doesn't get sentimental, so he's got a cool head, and is also not indifferent. There's a warm heart, and you want to combine the two. And so we said, well, if you take that as the inspiration, well, each of these elements, something comes up for us, and so frame should be useful, so you know what to do next, and it should also be meaningful, that it motivates you that yes, this is a question worth answering. That's what you need to deliver on the frame. 
And as part of this exercise, you've got alternatives. So you've got to have distinct directions. So if your strategy table doesn't show distinctness, it's not a very useful artifact. And it's also got to have interesting possibilities. It's tapping into the right brain space that, huh, we, we didn't even think about this. That's a high quality alternative uh, work that you, you, that you may have done. Information, do you have credible sources? That's the left brain thinking. And do you have compelling forecasts, as in things you can trust, but which really shake your world, that, that move you to act. Value, so the left brain is clear metrics. Can you trade things off? And the, and the right brain side is the noble purpose, which I think is it also enters the frame. So in that sense, are you clear about the noble purpose at the organizational level? Insightful reasoning, this comes much later, and inspiring narrative, as once you've put all of it together, have you got both these elements to move a community forward and get some real insights to act on? And finally, commitment, which is about knowing how you're gonna carry this out, as well as the intention to do this, you know, the leadership, followership that's needed. So that's kind of the broad picture. And most of these elements will touch on the frame in some way or the other. With that, I think we're out of time. Thank right. you so much. And if you have any further questions, we are around to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you.